Hello, everyone, and welcome to our webinar on identity and security solutions for complying with FDA and HIPAA regulations. I'm Julia Olinsky with the Global Sign Marketing Team, and I want to thank you all for joining us today. I'm happy to introduce today's presenter, Lila Key. Lila is Chief Product Officer here at Global Sign and is a PKI expert with a special focus on document signing, email, and authentication solutions. She has over 15 years of experience in the industry and has been heavily involved with ensuring Global Sign's products comply with various government regulations. So please feel free to send any questions you have over to Lila so she can cover them during the Q&A portion after the presentation. You can submit your questions to Lila using the questions box in your GoToMeeting control panel. We'll keep track and try to answer, answer them all at the end of the webinar. You can also follow us on Twitter at, at GlobalSign where we'll be sharing follow-up materials after today's presentation. And now, over to Lila. Thanks, Julie, for the great introduction. It's my pleasure to lead today's discussion on identity and security solutions for FTA and HIPAA compliance. Over the next 30 or 40 minutes, I hope to cover the following topics. How healthcare professionals can utilize digital certificates to interact with the FDA's electronic submissions gateway. How email security can support HIPAA's privacy requirements. A brief review of the FDA's federal code of regulation around electronic signatures. And an early assessment on how medical device manufacturers are applying this cybersecurity framework. And then we'll wrap up with a high-level overview of digital certificates and how they work. We'll review some of the pros and cons associated with various deployment options. So let's get started with the Federal Drug Administration's Electronic Submissions Gateway. Okay, so for those unfamiliar with the FDA ESG, it's basically a browser-based portal that acts as a central transmission point for sending information electronically to the FDA. It's basically a conduit for routing submissions to the proper FDA center or office. Anyone who needs to electronically submit a wide variety of documents to the FDA may use the ESG. For example, FDA centers that support electronic submissions include Center of Biologic Evaluation and Research, Center for Tobacco Products, and Center for Drug Evaluation and Research, um, just to name a few. Some examples of the types of documents submitted through the gateway include adverse events reports, biologic license applications, and new drug applications. Those wishing to interact with the ESG will need a digital certificate. The FDA, they, back when they established this program, determined that digital certificates were the most cost-effective and secure method to authenticate users and secure submissions. Basically, the identity as vouched by a certificate authority, such as GlobalSign, is used to bind the submitter's identity to the submissions made through the ESG. Beyond validating the identity of the document submitter, using certificates also provides additional benefits. First of all, it's helpful to encrypt the contents of the document, so only the receiving party, in this case the FDA, can view the information submitted. It provides content integrity. Um, basically, digital certificates provide a digital seal or a digital signature to make sure that any content submitted, if it has been altered, it will be tamper evident. And finally, it provides non-prudiation around the fact that that transaction did occur. So what type of certificate will you need? Well, according to the FDA, they require a certificate that at minimum has the submitter's full name or at least the correct email address in the digital certificate itself. So to meet this requirement, at minimum, you need a class one personal identification certificate to comply. However, you can use class two and higher certificates in the event you want to tie your organization details to your identity. So let's move on to how to secure email, how secure email can help achieve HIPAA compliance. So in respect to protected healthcare information, sensitive information sent via email is subject to the rules outlined in HIPAA. So the security rules around HIPAA specifically concerns all individually identifiable healthcare information a covered entity creates, receives, maintains, or transmits in electronic form. This is dubbed electronic protected health information. So, you know, what information is included in this definition? Basically, any information including demographic data that relates to the individual's past, present, or future physical or mental health condition. Also, the identity of the individual has to be clear that there's no way you can determine who that individual was, either through a birth date, a social security number, or name or address. So if you have any information that includes any of these elements, you are regulated under HIPAA, and that information must be secured through some type of encryption technology. 
So although the security rule doesn't dictate the exact security technology used to encrypt that information, we do have one recommendation. Using secure email can help you meet those requirements in a cost-effective and um, easy-to-use um, method. So S-Band basically is a technology that utilizes digital certificates to both digitally sign and encrypt email. In essence, digitally signing proves the origin of the message and detects if the message has been tampered with, whereas encryption makes sure that that message is confidential, that is being sent in an encrypted format, and only the intended recipient can decrypt the information using the public key associated with, I'm sorry, with the private key associated with the digital certificate. So exactly what is S-MIME? You often hear the term S-MIME when researching email signatures and encryption, and basically what it stands for is Secure Multipurpose Internet Mail Extensions. And this is just an industry standard for public key, um, infrastructure encryption for what's called MIME-based or message-based data. So why would you want to use S-MIME for email encryption? Well, probably the most compelling reason is that most email clients support it. Whether you're using Outlook, Thunderbird, Apple Mail, or to name a few, these mail clients are out of the box S9 compliant. So whether you're using your desktop or your mobile device, just using a digital certificate with this out of the box functionality will provide you a quick and cost effective and easy to use encryption and often HIPAA compliant solution. It's really, really quite easy. It's just a click of a button. Usually there's a button to encrypt or a button to sign, and um, it's quite um, easy to configure to have that functionality in your mail client. So SMIME addresses the HIPAA regulations in, in four main ways. Basically, it's going to address the confidentiality, integrity, and availability aspects of the regulation through encryption in digital signature technology. It's going to also protect against threats in terms of security and integrity. Um, hackers and men in the middle vulnerabilities are less likely to be successful using PKI technology. And the fact that the message is encrypted and can only be decrypted via the intended recipient protects that data over even untrusted networks like the internet. And finally, it's, it's going to protect against non-permissible um, actions or, or uses or disclosures. And this is where, if you're rolling this out at an enterprise level, you're going to ensure compliance throughout the entire workforce. So we have a couple of examples of um, what a signed or encrypted message would look like. In this example, it's a view through Outlook. And here you see on the left side a clear indication that the digital signature is trusted. As in this case with Outlook, Outlook has verified the certificate was issued by a trusted certificate authority, that root was in the trusted root store, and that the issuance of that certificate hasn't expired or been revoked. On the right side, we see an example of a message that included both the trusted signature and a padlock suggesting that that document or that message was encrypted and remained private. So as mentioned earlier, only the intended recipient who has possession of the private key associated with the certificate that was used to encrypt the message is able to view that message in the clear. Okay, let's move on to the FDA's Federal Code of Regulation 21 Part 11 around electronic signatures. So back in the late 70s, the FDA, like many government agencies, saw good reason to promote, promote the movement away from paper-based workflow, namely to reduce carbon footprint, to save on overhead costs associated with paper and shipping and storage, and really to reduce project timelines because when you're moving paper, it often goes through snail mail or just you know slow manual processes. So using electronic submissions certainly reduce timelines in terms of exchanging important documents and therefore um, increasing productivity. So the FDA really started encouraging electronic submissions back in 1997, and through 21 CFR Part 11, they provided the legislation as the foundation to make this electronic submission legally permissible. So basically, CFR 21 Part 11 set the criteria under which the FDA considers electronic records, electronic signatures, and handwritten signatures executed to electronic um, records to be trustworthy, reliable, and basically the general equivalent of paper records or handwritten signatures executed on paper. So Global Sign has a solution involving PDF signing that meets CFR 21 Part 11. So let's just take a quick review of that solution. 
So first of all, certificates in their private keys with the Global Health Science Solution are stored on cryptographic hardware. So either the private key is on a USB token or in the case of high volume solutions on a hardware security module. This private key protection adds an extra layer of security known as two-factor authentication. So basically it's something you have, the USB token, and something you know the pin to unlock the certificate in the private key on that token. This is very important because it adds a much level higher level of security over what we call soft certificates that are stored on local systems because again you need to have possession of the token as well as knowledge of the PIN. This goes a long way in terms of preventing men in the middle attacks which are very very prone to password authentication solutions. So PDF signing certificates are compatible with a variety of signing solutions such as Adobe Acrobat, Lifecycle, and um, even non-Adobe products like Assertia and Bluebeam software. So using these software signing solutions in conjunction with our digital signatures on our USB hardware provides a CFR 21 part 11 compliant solution. Then finally the additional feature to the solution is the signatures that we provide with PDF signing solutions come with trusted timestamps. So instead of relying on the system clock that could easily be altered through your control panel, you're able to use the Global Sign Trusted Timestamping Authority, which combined with our revocation checks and with our trusted routes, provides a long-term trusted signature that will be valid for well past the expiration date of the certificate. This is very, very important, especially for organizations that have long-term archiving requirements, sometimes over seven years. So how does it work? It's basically you, you use your signing application like Adobe Acrobat, you insert your token into your computer, and you navigate through the GUI and you click add a digital signature. When prompted, you'll have to log on to your USB token, and that's just usually a, a four to you know nine character pin. And then basically that allows you to add as many signatures to the PDF as you need. So here is an example of a signature that has been applied to a PDF. And we'll just take a, a little closer look at some of the characteristics. Basically, the signed um, electronic record has the identity of the author. In this case, it's Julie Olinsky. And we see information about Julie in the digital signature details about Julie's name, her email, and even her organization affiliation. One additional element has been added to comply with CFR 21 Part 11 because you need to supply the meaning associated with that transaction. And this is where Adobe Acrobat has put the reason code um, just for the sake of complying with this regulation. And then finally, like we mentioned before, you see the date and the time associated with this transaction. And this date and time originated from a trusted timestamp that Global Sign hosts and is available 24 by 7. So you have the ultimate in non-repudiation in terms of the signature is from who they say they were from, the document contents have not been altered, and that the transaction cannot be repudiated because of some challenge to the time that signature was applied. And then finally the last point in terms of mapping to 21 CFR Part 11 is the concept of signature and record linking. So because a signature basically seals the contents of the document and it's all in one PDF and all of this can be validated through the signature properties of the PDF, you can bind all the contents of that PDF to the signature and they're, they're connected. So this is the ultimate way to comply with 11.70 in terms of record linking by making sure that there's a tamper evidence seal that when this document is validated and each time it's validated, Adobe or other signing applications will verify that the original contents were exactly the same as the, docu the contents that are being validated. The relying party can feel assured that the linkage is still intact. And this is um, evident by the blue ribbon. Okay, so let's move over to some new developments around um, the cybersecurity framework in, in how the healthcare professionals are looking at that framework developed by NIST. So basically, NIST has had the cybersecurity framework, um, a couple iterations of it now for, for a year or two, but it was just really recently, back in this past October, that the FDA decided that they wanted to address how medical device manufacturers might incorporate the NIST-led framework. So 
the FDA has many good reasons to encourage medical device manufacturers um, to develop a cybersecurity control using the NIST framework. Namely, when you think about it, when the number of wireless internet network connected medical devices is increasing on an exponential basis. So as the electronic exchange of medical device related information um, increases, it was very, very important that there was a way to make sure that those um, transmissions were secure. When you think about it, failure to maintain cybersecurity not only can result in the compromise of the device functionality or the loss of data from the information that is being generated from this device, but it could potentially result in patient illness, injury, or even death. So basically, the FDA is, is you know, providing this guidance to any manufacturer that is you know, considering design and development of medical devices. This is going to be really focused on these systems that haven't gone to market yet. They're trying to get the security built in at pre-market submissions for those devices. So it won't be a bolt-on, but more a, a design consideration at the very, very beginning. So there was two main thrusts in terms of recommendations from the FDA's examination of the cybersecurity framework and how it would apply to medical device manufacturers. And you know, they, they basically cover identify and protect, meaning you know, how do we make sure that there's very good user access control and data integrity. You, you just want to, again, make sure that anyone who has access to these medical devices are strongly authenticated and that you have a layer of security to make sure that there's plenty of checks and balances to make sure that um, only authorized, in, in, in some cases, privileged users have access to devices themselves or device settings. So this is where multi-factor authentication is really coming into play. PKI becomes a, a, a strong candidate for this as a two-factor, very scalable very cost-effective method to deal with millions of devices, again, whether we're talking, you know, IoT or, or, or even just users, PKI has been proven as very scalable and, and, again, the framework suggests that this is a great candidate to address the multi-factor authentication requirements. Probably another really important consideration is all the firmware updates that are going to occur on these devices, you know, once you feel the device, it's not over, they're constantly be, being patched or updated with firmware updates, and you want to make sure that there's no malware being injected into those updates when they occur. So using PKI in the form of code signing certificates also becomes a, a very viable, scalable, and cost-effective method to address those vulnerabilities. And then again, detect, respond, and recover. It was a key focus of the recommendations. There's a lot of scrutiny around how you know logs and audits are going to be implemented and to make sure that there's plenty of checks and balances in actionable events in case there are problems detected, how to respond, how to avoid problems, how to take problems that were detected and make sure that they don't occur again. So these were, again, the two main thrusts that we saw out of the recent findings back in October. So I guess the key takeaways appear to be, you know, access control, ensuring that only, you know, trusted code is added to devices, that securing the data to and from the device is encrypted, that all endpoints are authenticated, both the device and, and anybody trying to access that device, whether it's a system or a user, and in making sure that you have an action plan for compromises. Because the sad reality is, it's not if it will happen, most likely you will have a compromise of some sort in the cybersecurity framework makes sure that there's equal focus on action plans to deal with, you know, compromises to to reduce the the impact as much as possible. In in probably equally important, learn from those mistakes or, or those compromises and, and factor that into your next iteration of your plan. So that really wraps up my discussion of the, the four main thrusts around healthcare initiatives that would all benefit from um, digital certificates and public key infrastructure technology. And for those who are unfamiliar with the technology, we thought we'd spend the, the last few minutes discussing what digital certificates are and providing just a high level overview to help explain the technology. So again, for some of the solutions we discussed, like the FDA, ESG, certificates are a requirement. So in the case of email, security, document signing, you might have different options, but some of these use cases, they do specify that you must have a digital certificate. 
So let's talk about some of the advantages on, on why certificates do make sense for many of these solutions. You know, we know that there's always a trade-off between increasing security to meet compliance and the costs involved and the burden on end users. And we, we do firmly believe that certificates hit that sweet spot between providing good security, low impact to users, and helping meet compliance um, or, or helping being comply with regulations. So BKI has proven in um, numerous ways to be cost effective, extremely scalable. In fact, um, we're being told that PKI is going to have a new lease on life in being able to support the billions of devices that we're going to see in the Internet of Things that are all going to require authentication. So with PKI, you're going to have a way to easily manage the life cycle of those devices as new devices come on board, as devices get retired, as new entities have different roles, using PKI is probably the most viable options in terms of end user impact in a cost effective method. So we understand that there's like many different ways to implement PKI and there's probably two main areas that most organizations are wrestling with. Do I want to use certificates and if so, do I want to provision them for my own in-house CA solution or do I want to go to a SaaS provider and, and have my certificates provided in a cloud-based solution. So there's you know, certainly pros and cons to both, but you have to be careful with those in-house solutions because often we talk about free certificates and, and free services that we get with our Microsoft CA that's part of our Microsoft server. But although the certificates themselves might, not, might be free, the costs associated with administrating them, securing them, making them highly available, and all the services that need to support those certificates have costs associated with it. So one has to ask if this truly is your core competency, and if not, will those free certificates in the long run be more expensive than going to a third-party CA? With third-party CAs, you have a much more flexibility, especially around deployment options. You're not building an infrastructure. In fact, we don't even call it a public key infrastructure. We call it a public key operation. And we have it's it's more conducive to business unit driven applications where you have a particular use case that needs a particular type of certificate and you can go to your third party CA and say this is the type I need and I only need X amount of them and in two weeks time. So there's lots of advantages of going to a third party CA in terms of flexibility and again using experts to rely on how those certificates are created. Additionally, often people will say well, yeah but I have my user repository in Active Directory and through Microsoft CA I don't want I, I can get my certificates silently installed or or automatically populated based on the information that's already in Active Directory but most third-party CAs including GlobalSign have proxies or, or gateways into Active Directory so you really can have the best of both worlds of staying in control of your policy staying in control of the identities associated with your users but then leveraging the Active Directory to automatically provision certificates to the cloud CA managed by experts. So you don't need any PKI expertise and you know finally uh, an additional benefit for certain use cases where public trust is needed when you get a certificate from a public certificate authority like GlobalSign those routes are already widely trusted in operating systems and in browsers and there's no need for a separate function of, of trusting private trust anchors and especially if you're dealing with B2B or B2C transactions there's a much lower cost associated with creating trust among constituents who, who are not leveraging the public routes in the browsers that they're using to access applications. So when you're looking at third-party CA deployments, you have, a, again, a couple of different options. You know, we understand, especially for applications like the FDA ESG, you might just need one certificate per organization. That might be your compliance officer, and, and that um, certificate is all you need for that application. And in that case, you can just go to our site and just purchase one certificate, and, and that certificate could just be all you need to, to deal with that one application and that one user accessing that application. However, there's some risks associated with just these one-off purchases or one-off installations. When you're using a certificate management solution, you have all your certificates, even if it's just one, under one umbrella 
providing you all the life cycle management that you need associated with that certificate. So you're not caught off guard if your certificate expires or if you have a change in roles and you need to revoke a certificate or you need to maybe reissue a certificate because someone has changed computer systems and maybe inadvertently lost their um, certificate or private key. So looking at management solutions to deal with a public key infrastructure and digital certificates is probably a good idea if you if you're looking at certificates for more than just the one-off. And finally, you know, there's tremendous cost savings when you're looking at multiple certificates and you're purchasing large volumes against often pre-vetted organization identities. You're going to look at certificates that, you know, are, are going down to the, the couple dollar levels instead of, you know, probably, probably five times that amount if you're looking at buying one-offs. So if you are looking at a large scale deployment, you know, scalability will be a huge factor in your decision making. You're going to want to look at a CA like Global Sign that has APIs available to be able to do direct issuance to our CA. You're going to, like I mentioned earlier, probably want to leverage proxies into your Active Directory so you don't have to rekey the user information into your certificate authority, certificate management system. And you're going to want to find some maybe sweet spots for bulk enrollment. Maybe you have a couple hundred certificates that it's not worth integrating with the API, but you certainly don't want to have to rekey or, or uh, manually issue one by one. So maybe you just want to upload a CSV file to, um, to do a bulk registration of end user certificates. So, you know, no matter what your your where you are on the spectrum, whether you need a single certificate or a few hundred or or tens of thousands or even millions, Global Sign has implementation models that will help you have a solution to, to meet your scalable needs. So there's a lot to consider when tackling government regulations. And you know, I hope this presentation has opened your eyes to some of the ease of use considerations, some of the security options. In, in some of the regulations imposed by the FDA in, in HIPAA and in, in how these solutions can help you meet those regulations. These solutions, they don't just help you meet co compliance and, and that's probably my final big point I'd like to make. They really do help you secure your, your, your customer's information, your employee's information, and your corporate information. So we're, we're trying to um, deviate from checkbox compliance and we're, we're trying to look for solutions that not only help you meet regulations but also make you more secure, but of course always mindful of cost consideration and end user experience. So that really wraps up my formal presentation and um, I think now's a good time to look at any of the questions that may have been submitted. So I'm looking at the question about one of the key best practices in the NIST cybersecurity framework is supply chain risk management. And um, the question is, what support is Global Sign providing in terms of evidence to support a company assigning a risk assessment of low for a digital certificate? I'm going to try to address this in, in a, a non-healthcare related example because Global Sign is very involved in the cybersecurity framework in terms of how this applies to the energy sector. And we uh, are NASB or North American Energy Standard Board compliant CA that uses assurance levels to issue the appropriate certificate type depending upon the risk associated with that transaction. So to be clear, Global Sign does not assign the assurance level or the type of certificate required for a certain risk. That in terms of energy is done by the, the application owners themselves or the energy providers. Often with the NERC SIP, um, the Critical Infrastructure Protection ruling, it is up to the system operator to determine what the appropriate assurance level is. And I think this would be the same for healthcare professionals. It's only for organizations really to, to make that determination themselves what the risk of breach of, of a you know cyber transaction might be. From there, you would go to Global Sign and say, okay, I have medium risk associated with this transaction or high risk or low risk or rudimentary risk. And this is where we would help issue the right type of certificate to, to meet that risk level that you determined. There's a lot more on that, and I do encourage whoever's asking that question to contact me directly because I'm, I, I know I shortchanged that answer, and we, we have lots more to share on that. So please feel free to reach back out to me. Okay, we also have a question about the email solution and whether it would work on mobile devices. And um, the answer is yes, absolutely. Um, you can, and in some cases on our iOS devices, you can um, have those certificates 
provisioned right over the ear, directly onto the mobile devices. Most popular mobile devices support secure email, so you can for sure use certificates in with your mobile device email client to digitally sign and um, encrypt email messages. Oh yes, okay, so there's a question about is there a way to streamline the initial certificate exchange needed for encrypted email? That's an excellent question. So before um, messages can be encrypted, um, they need to the the sender needs to acquire the public certificate of the recipient to um, encrypt that message. And this um, can be streamlined by using directories, um, especially active directories. So right now we do have a solution where we have um, Active Directory get a copy of every um, issued certificate from our CA and then from that repository users can get the public certificate of the recipient from that directory. Now that, to be fair, works great for internal, you know, employee to employee transactions. If you're talking about B2B encryption, there um, are other methods you can do that, but often it requires sending um, prearranged digitally signed messages to be able to get the public certificate embedded in the certificate to um, then use to encrypt the message. So that's a it's a good question. If the certificate expires, will you still be able to read the email? The answer is yes. Um, the uh, as long as you um, archive the first of all, if it's digitally signed, you'll always be able to read it, even if the certificate expires. But if you've sent an encrypted email, it's really important that you don't delete your um, certificate, even though it may have expired, because you'll need the private key to be able to decrypt that um, that message um, down the road. So it's very very important if you are doing secure email and you're sending encrypted messages that you save your certificate and corresponding private key even if that certificate has expired. And um, again, I would encourage the, um, the, the person who has submitted this question to contact me because there's, there's all sorts of key recovery and other um, solutions that would also address this question as well. Um, someone is asking a question about um, the price of these solutions that we've discussed. And you know, it's, it's, a, it's a big kind of all depends and it's usually de depending on two factors. One, the, the more users you have, the, the greater your volume discount will be, and also the validity date. Um, we often issue one, two, and three year valid certificates, and um, if you get multi-year certificates, you see significant discounts as well. So again, I, I would say the prices go anywhere between, you know, if you bought one certificate around $80, and if you bought many, many certificates, those prices could go down to just a handful of dollars. I think we have time for one more question. Okay, right, so here's a question about, you know, I, I guess, um, I talked a lot about document signing in the context of PDF. In the um, the the question was around are there other types of documents that can use digital signatures? Um, the answer is yes, for sure. Um, I guess the the probably the most po uh, second popular um, format for sending digitally signed documents would be any Microsoft Office document. Microsoft Office, whether it's Excel, PowerPoint, or Word, allows you to apply a digital signature to the document. If those signatures have um, a root anchor that is in the public trust, in the Windows public trust um, repository, they will be instantly validated. So um, global science certificates that I use to sign those documents would be instantly validated through those um, Microsoft Office applications. All right, Julie, I, I think we're, we're um, nearing the, the end of the half hour, so I'm going to hand it over to you. And um, I just want to thank everybody for their time. And again, um, please send your questions that we weren't able to um, answer and to me directly, and we'll get answers to you back as soon as possible. So thanks again for your time. Have a great day, everybody. Okay, thanks, Isla, and thanks again to everyone who um, joined the webinar. We hope you enjoyed it. I do want to point out a couple of people asked if we would be recording this, and we are. We'll be sending a copy along to all of you uh, in the over email over the next few days, and then we'll also make uh, it available on our website and via social media, so keep an eye on that. Uh, we'll also be, um, we usually do, uh, we try to acknowledge any questions we weren't able to get to during the webinar um, in blog posts, 
uh, after we have the live uh, presentation. So if you want to keep an eye on our Global Sign blog, uh, we might be able to get to some of the questions that uh, we weren't able to get to today. So thanks again, everyone. Have a great day.